If this is your brain, well, this might be your brain on magic mushrooms. Our culture has depicted what happens in your brain Any questions? in many ways. Alice falling into Wonderland as a red pill moment. You take the red pill and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. But up until the last decade, we didn't really know the neuroscience of magic mushrooms. So dive in with me as I explore the science of these magical mushrooms. Your brain on magic mushrooms. Humans and other animals have eaten psychedelic mushrooms for hundreds of thousands of years. At least, we can only assume. We see it in ancient artifacts all over the world, but particularly present in Central America, where these practices survived into modern times. Old scrolls and texts throughout the ages seem to describe the use too, but not in the scientific terms we'd use today. Terence McKenna, the famous psychonaut, even hypothesized that the cognitive revolution and transformation of Homo erectus into Homo sapiens was caused by the consumption of magic mushrooms. And this might seem far-fetched, unless maybe you've just eaten some mushrooms. Most scientists still consider this a fringe theory, but at the very least, it's an interesting thought experiment that by the end of this video, you may think has some merit. First, it's important to start by explaining that this mushroom is not the same as this mushroom. This is the fly agaric. They are hallucinogenic and do have a long history of use around the globe, things I've discussed many times on this channel. This, however, is what people refer to as a magic mushroom. Collectively, this term refers to all mushrooms that contain psilocybin and psilocin, the active compounds. In total, there are over 200 species in these genera. They're also illegal in many places in the world, and thus, the information presented here is not a promotion of their use. But I can confirm that the neuroscience to date is fascinating. The most famous of these magic mushrooms is probably Psilocybe cubensis, which has cultivated forms such as the famous golden teachers. So we'll use this one specifically as our example. Inside this mushroom, there is a compound called psilocybin, as well as a few other minor compounds. Psilocybin roughly is 1% of the dried weight. When researchers study it though, they use a synthetic psilocybin so they can calibrate research findings directly with the amount of this compound. But for now, let's just assume this dried mushroom is composed of about 1% of mainly psilocybin and we'll go from there. If you were to eat one of these mushrooms, the psilocybin actually converts in the stomach to psilocin, the biologically active compound. Technically, psilocybin is a prodrug and isn't biologically active. Psilocin, however, is, and this is what causes the effects we see. It can enter the bloodstream and will bind to your brain's serotonin receptors, specifically the 5-HT2A receptors. This opens the ion channel, which can create a cascade of events. You might have heard of this before, but at this point it's worth backing up a bit to understand the nervous system, serotonin, and serotonin receptors. Everyone has a nervous system full of neurons. Neurotransmitters carry chemical signals from one neuron to the next target cell. And that could either be another nerve, a muscle cell, or a gland. Common neurotransmitters include dopamine, acetylcholine, glutamate, GABA, endorphins, and serotonin. Serotonin as a neurotransmitter plays a key role in your mood, sleep, digestion, and sexual desire. You may also know that a lot of antidepressants like SSRIs, work by preventing serotonin from being taken back up, and thus it increases the amount of serotonin in the system. This helps people feel better, at least temporarily. SSRIs have been shown to be 53 to 64% effective in relieving depression in patients. That means just over half the people does it work for, which is not a ton. And interestingly, psilocybin therapy, which also targets serotonin pathways, has been shown in one study to be approximately 67% effective in relieving the depressive symptoms of patients. So why does psilocybin work differently? Well, first, the pathway is a bit different. It's not just more serotonin in the system like an SSRI. Also know this, there are many different serotonin receptors in the body. Scientists describe these ones with nomenclature like this. This particular one, the 5-HT2A receptor, is the one that psilocin binds to and then works to open that ion channel. Those 5-H2A receptors are found in the highest concentrations in these regions of the brain, particularly prefrontal cortex and thalamus. So then researchers gave psilocybin to people and they scanned their brain. It looked like this. It led to increased crosstalk, 
across brain regions. And unless you're used to looking at brains, it's probably hard to tell here. So you can see it like this. Each of these colors around the circle is a different part of the brain. Auditory, visual, olfactory, etc. Most of the times, these regions connect to each other with crosstalk, but there's only a few connections like this to other regions. But this is on psilocybin. Look at the crosstalk between regions. It's so much stronger. And this is why your brain on mushrooms can lead to sensory mix-up. Tasting colors, seeing music, for example. But psilocybin doesn't just increase brain activity. For one area of the brain, the default mode network, it actually reduces activity and connectivity. So what is the default mode network, you say? It's a network of brain regions that are involved in self-referential thinking, introspection, and the sense of self. It's active when we're thinking about ourselves, we're recalling memories, or we're planning for the future. Psilocybin's suppression of this brain region leads to a diminished sense of self, and what people describe as ego dissolution, where people often feel less separation between themselves and the world around them. You can feel connected to everything. Now stop and understand this. An overactive default mode network is associated with health disorders like depression, anxiety, and OCD. It can lead to rumination, self-criticism, and inflexible thought patterns. So by temporarily loosening the default mode network, people can sometimes break free from the habitual self-referential thinking and adopt new, less restrictive perspectives. The process also leads to increased neuroplasticity, where the brain is more receptive to forming new connections. This can lead to lasting changes in mood and outlook even after the drug wears off. So unlike SSRIs that are taken every day, researchers at Johns Hopkins have shown that taking two to three high doses of magic mushrooms along with therapy can have these lasting effects that create permanent health benefits. Now, before I give my thoughts on how this mechanism may be creating lasting change, let me note that magic mushrooms, unfortunately, are not legal in many places. I just want to describe how the science works and help you understand what is happening in the brain. And this might be a good point to mention that I use Magic Mind every day as my own way to boost my brain power. We're talking a lot about magic mushrooms, but they are not legal. Um, in here, there are all sorts of legal fungi, plants that act as nootropics. They help give you calm energy. There are adaptogens. I've been using it for over a year and a half. I definitely recommend it. I think you would get a lot of benefit out of it too. It builds over time. It has all sorts of things in it, including lion's mane, bacopa, rodalia, ashwagandha, turmeric. I'm doing videos on all of these, thanks in part to the fact that Magic Mind is a sponsor of this series. It's mostly just giving me the opportunity to go into the science, including making a video like I have here for Magic Mushrooms. Now, if you wanna try Magic Mind yourself, use the code right here in the link below, STONEAGEM20 at checkout for your discount. So let's wrap this up. Mushrooms have psilocybin, which eventually affects a serotonin receptor in the brain. But even if we know that pathway, it still doesn't explain the fact that some people need only one or a few doses instead of daily doses like the model for other pharmaceuticals. What research at Johns Hopkins has found, though, is that it's not just the dose that matters. It's if that dose creates a mystical experience. In other words, a deep sense of unity with the universe, a higher power, or reality beyond themselves. So here's my interpretation. Your default mode network is kind of like your master filter. By shutting it down briefly, it can open your eyes to a new way of thinking that could be of great benefit. If people come to the conclusion that they're connected to things greater than them, it profoundly affects their depression. And with some therapy and other types of integration, it's extremely helpful. So that is my brief conclusion that's based on still, well, somewhat limited science. I really want to hear your thoughts, though, on how you think it works in the comments below. If you are excited about the science that I presented here on these mushrooms or any of the mushrooms that I talk about on the Stone Age Man channel, then I want to direct you to a couple of resources. First, I'd like to direct you to Patreon, and that's not just to be able to support the educational outreach that I'm doing, which doesn't always make a lot of money here on YouTube, but I think is very important. It's also so that you can reach out directly to me and I can interact with you, and if you have questions, say, on this mushroom or on others, then that's where you can get a hold of me and I can spend the time and talk about it on, say, some of the live streams that we do or just directly through DMs. And two, you should watch 
both of these two videos in order, probably. One is the basics of psilocybin mushrooms and the other one is a behind the scenes trip to Jamaica where you can see what's actually happening at one of these retreat centers. All right, good luck with your journey. We will see you in the next one.